Section 38 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 38. On Household Gods and Goblins Some time ago, I went with some children to see Maeterlinck's fine and delicate fairy play about the bluebird that brought everybody happiness. For some reason or other, it did not bring me happiness, and even the children were not quite happy. I will not go so far as to say that the bluebird was a blue devil, but it left in us something seriously like the blues. The children were partly dissatisfied with it, because it did not end with a day of judgment, because it was never revealed to the hero and heroine that the dog had been faithful and the cat faithless, for children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. But there was something wrong about the bluebird, even from my more mature and corrupt point of view. There were several incidental things I did not like. I did not like the sentimental passage about the love affair of two babes unborn. It seemed to me a piece of what may be called bad berry, and logically it spoilt the only meaning of the scene, which was that the babes were looking to all earthly experiences as things inconceivable. I was not convinced when the boy exclaimed, There are no dead, for I am by no means sure that he, or the dramatist, knew what he meant by it. I heard a voice from heaven cry, Blessed are the dead. I do not know all that is meant in that, but I think the person who said it knew. But there was something more continuous and clinging in the whole business which left me vaguely restless, and I think the nearest to a definition was that I felt as if the poet were condescending to everything, condescending to pots and pans and birds and beasts and babies. The one part of the business which I really felt to be original and suggestive was the animation of all the materials of the households, as if with familiar spirits, the spirit of fire, the spirit of water, and the rest. And even here I felt a faint difference which moved me to an imaginary comparison. I wonder that none of our medievalists have made a morality or allegorical play founded on the canticle of St. Francia, which speaks somewhat similarly of brother fire and sister water. It would be a real exercise in Gothic craftsmanship and decoration to make these symbolic figures at once stiff and fantastic. If nobody else does this, I shall be driven to spoil the idea myself, as I have spoiled so many other rather good ideas in my time. But the point of the parallel at the moment is merely this, that the medieval poet does strike me as having felt about fire like a child, while the modern poet felt about it like a man talking to children. Few and simple as are the words of the older poem, it does somehow convey to me that when the poet spoke of fire as untamable and strong, he felt it as something that might conceivably be feared as well as loved. I do not think the modern poet feared the nursery fire as a child who loved it might fear it. And this elemental quality in the real primitives brought back to my mind something I have always felt about this conception, which is the really fine conception in the bluebird. I mean something like that which the heathens embodied in the images of the household gods. The household gods, I believe, were carved out of wood, which makes them even more like the chairs and tables. The nomad and the anarchist accuse the domestic ideal of being merely timid and prim, but this is not because they themselves are bolder or more vigorous, but simply because they do not know it well enough to know how bold and vigorous it is. The most nomadic life today is not the life of the desert, but of the industrial cities. It is by a very accurate accident that we talk about a street Arab, and the Semitic description applies to not a few gutter snipes whose gilded chariots have raised them above the gutter. They live in clubs and hotels and are often simply ignorant, I might almost say innocent, of the ancient life of the family, and certainly of the ancient life on the farm. When a townsman first sees these things directly and intimately, he does not despise them as dull, but rather dreads them as wild, as he sometimes takes a tame cow for a wild bull. 
The most obvious example is the hearth, which is the heart of the home. A man living in the lukewarm air of centrally heated hotels may be said to have never seen fire. Compared to him, the housewife at the fireside is an Amazon wrestling with a flaming dragon. The same moral might be drawn from the fact that the watchdog fights while the wild dog often runs away. Of the husband, as of the house dog, it may often be said that he has been tamed into ferocity. This is especially true of the sort of house represented by the country cottage. It is only in theory that the things are petty and prosaic. A man realistically experiencing them will feel them to be things big and baffling and involving a heavy battle with nature. When we read about cabbages or cauliflowers in the papers, and especially the comic papers, we learn to think of them as commonplace. But if a man of any imagination will merely consent to walk round the kitchen garden for himself and really look at the cabbages and cauliflowers, he will feel at once that they are vast and elemental things like the mountains and the clouds. He will feel something almost monstrous about the size and solidity of the things swelling out of that small and tidy patch of ground. There are moods in which that everyday English kitchen plot will affect him as men are affected by the reeking wealth and toppling rapidity of tropic vegetation, the green bubbles and crawling branches of a nightmare. But whatever his mood he will see that things so large and work so laborious cannot possibly be merely trivial. His reason, no less than his imagination, will tell him that the fight here waged between the family and the field is of all things the most primitive and fundamental. If that is not poetical, nothing is poetical, and certainly not the dingy bohemianism of the artists in the towns. But the point for the moment is that even by the purely artistic test, the same truth is apparent. An artist looking at these things, with a free and a fresh vision, will at once appreciate what I mean by calling them wild rather than tame. It is true of fire, of water, of vegetation, of half a hundred other things. If a man reads about a pig, he will think of something comic and commonplace, chiefly because the word pig sounds comic and commonplace. If he looks at a real pig in a real pigsty, he will have the sense of something too large to be alive, like a hippopotamus at the zoo. This is not a coincidence or a sophistry. It rests on the real and living logic of things. The family is itself a wilder thing than the state, if we mean by wildness that it is born of will and choice as elemental and emancipated as the wind. It has its own laws, as the wind has, but properly understood, it is infinitely less subservient than things are under the elaborate and mechanical regulations of legalism. Its obligations are love and loyalty, but these are things quite capable of being in revolt against merely human laws. For merely human law has a great tendency to become merely inhuman law. It is concerned with events that are in the moral world what cyclones and earthquakes are in the material world. People are not born in an infant school any more than they die in an undertaker's shop. These prodigies are private things and take place in the tiny theater of the home. The public systems, the large organization, are a mere machinery for the transport and distribution of things. They do not touch the intrinsic nature of the things themselves. If a birthday present is sent from one family to another, all the legal system and even all that we call the social system, is only concerned with the present so long as it is a parcel. Nearly all our modern sociology might be called the philosophy of parcels. For that matter, nearly all our modern descriptions of utopia, or the great state, might be called the paradise of postmen. It is in the inner chamber that the parcel becomes a present, that it explodes, so to speak, into its own radiance and real popularity and it is equally true, so far as that argument is concerned, whether it is a bonbon or a bomb. The essential message is always a personal message. The important business is always private business. And this is, of course, especially with the first of all birthday presents which presents itself at birth, and it is no exaggeration to talk of a bomb as the symbol of a baby. 
Of course, the same is true of the tragic as of the beatific acts of the domestic drama, of the spade work of the struggle for life, or the Damoclean sword of death. The defense of domesticity is not that it is always happy, or even that it is always harmless. It is rather that it does involve, like all heroic things, the possibilities of calamity, and even of crime. Old Mother Hubbard may find that the cupboard is bare. She may even find a skeleton in the cupboard. All that is involved here is the insistence on the true case for this intimate type of association. That in itself it is certainly not commonplace, and most certainly is not conventional. The conventions belong rather to those wider worldly organizations which are now set up as rivals to it, to the club, to the school, and above all to the state. You cannot have a successful club without rules, but a family will really do without rules exactly in proportion as it is a successful family. What somebody said about the songs of a people could be said much more truly about the jokes of a household. And a joke is, in its nature, a wild and spontaneous thing. Even the modern fanaticism for organization has never really attempted to organize laughter like a chorus. Therefore, we may truly say that these external emblems or examples of something grotesque and extravagant about our private possessions are not mere artistic exercises in the incongruous. They are not, as the phrase goes, mere paradoxes. They are really related to the aboriginal nature of the institution itself and the idea that is behind it. The family really is something as wild and elemental as a cabbage. End of section 38「Section 39 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End. Wanted, a radical party. Perhaps it would be an exaggeration, and one a little lacking in charity, to say that the Puritans now concentrate on prohibition because it is the only piece of morality they have left. But there would be a truth in the travesty, for it is very curious to watch how the nonconformist conscience has hardened on this one matter, while it has gone soft on so many other things. In the matter of sex, about which it was once a byword for severity, it has really begun to exhibit the strangest sort of laxity. Marriage may be almost indefinitely dissolved and dissipated, so long as the dissipation is called divorce. Ireland, to take an example, is at this moment threatened with massacre and misery because the Irish question was not settled, though very nearly settled thirty years ago. The Irish question was not settled thirty years ago, because the whole nonconformist world rose in horror at the private conduct of Parnell, who married a divorced wife whom he had loved when she was practically a deserted wife. In other words, the deliverer of Ireland was enthroned, and Ireland left undelivered, because he had done something which the whole modern divorce movement would permit him, and practically encouraged him to do. Take so typical a representative of popular Puritanism as the nonconformist novelist Mr. Silas Hawking. He is a man very representative, and I believe very sincere, and he has made himself a champion and chief controversialist on behalf of divorce. Indeed, his doctrine, whether he himself understands it or no, would involve almost infinite divorce. In criticizing a book of mine on the subject, he argued that a man might repudiate the marriage contract exactly as he would repudiate any business contract, like that between a publisher and an author. I pointed out to Mr. Hawking that I was not in the habit of making to my publisher a solemn vow in a sacred building. I never worshipped my publisher with my body, or promised to keep myself to him till death did us part. But Mr. Hawking distinctively said, whatever he may have met, that the question was whether the publisher or partner or other parties to the contract had not got out of it what he had a right to expect. That is, presumably, whether the husband or wife had found reasonable happiness in the marriage. 
After all, had poor Kitty O'Shea found reasonable happiness in her marriage? Was O'Shea any better than scores of husbands whose claims are now calmly dissolved? Was Parnell any worse than scores of co-respondents who are now reintroduced into respectable society? The truth is that the old institution of marriage, on behalf of which the Puritans made the great demonstration only thirty years ago, has already been abolished in England, and largely with the assistance of the Puritans. Much of the futility that has fallen on the nonconformists, considered as a nonconformist, has unfortunately fallen on the same type considered as a radical, and the political laxity is even more lamentable than the religious, in the sense that it is less excusable. The Puritan has not really defended purity, but the liberal has not even defended liberty. He also has been false to his own chosen ideals, and the ideals he chose were not even so arduous and austere. The recent failure of radicalism has lain in not being efficiently radical. It is not going to the root of the matter, and not having the courage to uproot it. With one or two more honorable exceptions, my old friends the liberals had conspicuously failed to fight for liberty in the one way that really matters, that is, to fight for liberty against the really powerful enemies of liberty. They have preferred to fight against a rapidly weakening aristocracy rather than against a rapidly strengthening plutocracy. They have conducted a struggling sham fight against a few squires, while the whole world is full of the murmur of the millions against the millionaires. They have continued to tell old village tales about the tyranny of the parson when every village school and village almhouse is overshadowed with the tyranny of the professor. After the professors had made war on Europe with all the guns and gases of hell, they continued to hunt not the professors, but the priests. They continued to talk about the priest in the school and the priest in the home. They continued to look for a Jesuit by way of a skeleton in the cupboard, and looked under the bed for a bishop instead of a burglar. They continued to repeat what they had heard from their great-grandmother's parrot, that venerable Victorian bird, that clericalism was the enemy, though they had not seen the enemy with their own eyes, filling the skies with the engines of modern science, and filling the libraries with the ethics of Nietzsche and the Prussian pupil of Voltaire. They helped patriotically to destroy Prussia, but they did not understand what they had destroyed or why they had destroyed it. They were doing their duty as Englishmen, but they did not know, as they should have known, that they were doing their duty as radicals. Since the war, they have become only too eagerly persuaded of the absurd contradiction that the duty of a radical is to be a pacifist, as if a revolutionist uprooting things could ever be at peace. This type of man, though individually a very honest and healthy character in many ways, has entirely lost his bearings at the present time. He does not know where he is, or what he ought to hold, and least of all what he ought to attack. I have taken the example of foreign policy and the Great War, but the case is, if possible, even stronger, touching domestic policy and peace. Here again, what is wrong with the radical is that he is in the very worst sense a conservative. Only instead of conserving a compromise, he is conserving a conflict, and a conflict which is altogether out of date, which carries the drums and banners of a battle as remote as the Wars of the Roses. In domestic politics, also, the liberal will profess to be jealous of the encroachments of orthodox and organized religion. But as a fast, there is no organized religion to compare with the oppressive regimentation of organized irreligion. There are no tests that impose orthodoxy to compare with the tests that impose heresy like the heresies of hygiene. The old doctrines of theology are not forcibly imposed on anybody. But the new theories of science are forcibly imposed upon everybody. The priest cannot call in the policeman to help him impose a penance but the doctor can call in the policeman to help him impose an operation. People are not driven into a church, but they are driven out of a public house. But all this vast and violent aggression on the part of the materialists seems to be quite invisible to the radical, who is haunted with his ancient hatred of harmless mystics. All this rigid and militant regimentation may have a morality of its own, and it may be quite right that those who believe in it should support it but surely there ought to be somewhere a liberal morality to resist it. 
and the party that was supposed to stand for liberty seems to have lost its chance in human history and failed to resist it at all on any calculation there must be something to be said for liberty and it is the liberal who refuses to say it it is all the more curious because i suspect that even in the vulgar electioneering sense it would be a popular thing to say i cannot understand why the liberal instead of talking rather more vaguely than the coalitionist about schemes of industrial welfare and social reform does not put himself at the head of the real discontent that is roused by all this dragooning and detection i suppose the fact is the final confession that every party now depends not on popularity but on plutocracy not even on vote catching but merely on money getting one would think that any man worth calling a radical would have no doubt about his sympathies in a contest between the crofters and a capitalist but capitalists can contribute to the party funds and crofters cannot the party funds have become more important than the party votes let alone the party principles yet even upon this calculation the coldness of liberals about freedom remains something of a mystery if they are practical politicians we do not of course expect them to do anything but surely it is strange that politicians should not even say anything why in the world have not these politicians had the sense to promise us emancipation one would think that it was a question of their being expected to keep their promises surely no such restraint as that need impair the eloquence and energy of our national leaders at the next general election surely they might make some new promises as freely as they made the old promises and keep them as carefully as they have kept the old promises they promised us a sort of utopia after the war surely they might find the courage to promise us the ordinary liberties of the subject which we possessed even before the war they promised us a country fit for heroes to live in surely they might promise us a country fit for grown men to live in they promised us a league of nations to protect us from foreign tyrants and imperialistic invaders over whom they had really no control surely they might promise to protect us from the bureaucratic tyrants and invading inspectors over whom they have complete control they talked as if they believed in the war that would end war surely they could at least talk as if the war had not ended citizenship they promised us so much and they have done so little surely they might promise a little more even if they do a little less as an old radical i suggest that there might be a new radicalism i cannot understand why nobody is preparing for the next general election with a real radical program as i have said it might well have a certain superficial success even if it were never anything more than a program why does not somebody refresh the stale dregs of a dead socialism with a new individualism why does not somebody try to repeat the triumph of joe chamberlain and his three acres and a cow why does not someone pit that sort of small property against the fabian vision of officials ploughing thousands of acres and officials driving herds of cattle we have reached the precise psychological moment when the repetition of it as a rumor has prepared the way for it as a novelty it is now just sufficiently familiar to appear to be entirely fresh ten years ago it may be nobody would have understood it ten years hence please god everybody will understand it but at this particular moment a politician bringing it forward would seem to be both original and democratic both individual and social it would be the most promising of all policies if like so many policies it were promising and nothing else End of section 39 section 40 of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness 1922 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Master versus Makers. 
I have just been looking at the new Labour paper, or to be precise, at the new leader, with which is incorporated the Labour leader. I looked at it with interest because I certainly think that Labour wants a new leader, and we never, from the first, profess to offer anything but a new witness. That is to say, we are valid witnesses to the fact that proletarians and especially manual labourers have, as a historical fact, been cruelly crushed by capitalism. But we do not profess to be manual labourers ourselves. It would be misleading for middle-class sympathisers such as we are to call ourselves labourers in the common sense. But we are exceedingly glad that the real technical manual labourers, the bricklayers, and the joiners and the plasterers should have an organ of their own. Hence my interest in looking at it and at the names displayed on its first page. The first name I see is that of Professor Einstein. It may be that the professor, while not perhaps in the technical trade union sense a bricklayer, is nevertheless a sort of patron saint of bricklayers. It may be that his great theory, that all straight lines are crooked, is invoked by bricklayers when piling a tower of brick, that his idea that a foot rule measures more one way than the other is a technical working principle of the trade union, that the bricklayers balanced on high ladders may be heard disputing about his higher mathematics. This is possible. It is perhaps a little more probable that the presence of Professor Einstein's article is due to the fact that it is an article that implies a plea for Prussia. But of one thing I am very certain, I am every bit as likely to hear two real bricklayers on top of a real ladder discussing relativity as I am to hear them uttering this sort of pacifism or this sort of apology for Prussianism. The next horny-handed proletarian I find, filling the central pages of the page, is Professor Arthur Thompson. I am not sure which trade union he belongs to, whether to the National Union of Astronomers and the Guild of Higher Mathematicians, like Professor Einstein, or to the Invisible Guild of Poets with that admirable poet, Mr. Walter de la Marais. For the rest, there are several able and honest people with whom I sympathize, possibly all the more because they happen to be all people of my own class and education. Such is my sublime class consciousness. The admiration of the world. Mr. G. D. H. Cole is my old schoolfellow at one of the old public schools. Mr. H. N. Brailsford is my old fellow journalist and radical colleague of the Daily News, every bit as bourgeois as I am. Mrs. Swanwick is the daughter of a Dante scholar whose name I shall always hold in love and veneration, but who was certainly more and not less academic than I am. Honestly, I cannot see why the word labour should be tacked on to these people on the new leader any more than ourselves in the new witness. I am inclined to think there are as many navies and dustmen in our list of contributors as in theirs, but I have left the greatest name in their list to the last, and it is with that I am really concerned. I see that Mr. H. G. Wells, in an eloquent and just tribute to the late Sanderson of Ondal has referred to the distinction which I noted in the new witness many years ago, when it was advanced by Mr. Bartrand Russell. It is expressed in the statement, possessiveness has to give way to creativeness, and the idea of dominance to the idea of service. The later antithesis, I confess, has begun to bore me a good deal. I deny there is anything good about service in the abstract, without reference to what we serve. The sight of all the front bench politicians standing like a row of flunkies in the liveries of a new millionaire does not increase my enthusiasm for the term. A fine chain of meaning, something more than a misprint, may at any moment turn the word service into the word servile, nor do I think the hostile term in itself worthy of so much abstract hostility. I do not think there is anything wrong in a man being dominant when he is dominating devils, or anything good in a man serving when he is serving devils. Nor is it a matter of merely militant domination, as in the war against things that are evil, there is also a peaceful and human's domination of things are good. 
A man need not be the conqueror, but he can be the king of his cat and dog, his chairs and tables, his house and field. And that brings us back to the first and far more valuable and interesting antithesis, and to the old problem of property. The important part of the sentence is the beginning of it. Possessiveness has to give way to creativeness. Now, the first thing that occurs to me to say about this is that if possessiveness does give way, the creativeness will always give way. Do not imagine for a moment that I'm thinking of the mean and vulgar argument used by capitalist against socialist that the artist will not work unless he has an incentive, that is, unless he has money enough to buy a peerage and purchase a castle as handsome as a pork butcher's. That I need hardly say is not the point at all. That was an argument invented by a pork butcher trying in vain to imagine why the devil the man became an artist. An artist can do perfectly well without incentives in that sense. He can often do without success or popularity. He can sometimes almost do without bread and cheese. But there are two things that the artist cannot possibly do without. He cannot do without possessiveness, and he cannot do without domination. Even the artist may be glad to have the cheese as well as the bread. Even the artist need not be the absent-minded as not to know the difference between chalk and cheese. But the possessiveness involved here is not concerned with the cheese so much as the chalk. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that I have realized one of my secret dreams, and am engaged in drawing on a great white wall or ceiling with a piece of black or red chalk as long as a pole. Drawing designs on a scale, if not exactly in the style of Michelangelo, the only two things I must have besides a chalk and a wall are possessiveness or a grip on the chalk, and domination or the power of deciding the design on the wall. Now, of course, it would be possible to make that Mr. Wells could call a larger, more social, more coordinated and cooperative use of the piece of chalk. You could have a whole crowd of comrades. Hanging onto a single stick of chalk, like a company carrying a battering ram, you could, by their combined or conflicting movements, make a series of marks on the white wall. And I can imagine Mr. H. G. Wells or Mr. Bertrand Russell or some other moralist describing that design in terms of ethical or aesthetic eulogy. I can imagine their explaining to us how those vast vague curves revealed. The impersonal purpose, which is the paradox of their religion, how those strange lines that seem at first sight to be wavering and wandering show the subconsciousness of society seeking the truth, how those rather erratic dots and jerks are warning signals that punctuate the impatience of the populace, or I can imagine the alternative school of Mr. Sidney Webb, proving to me that a machine could be made to hold the red chalk. In one iron claw, and make rhythmic and recurrent marks on the same wall day and night. I do not say that there could be no interest in these experiments. I only say they would be no use for my experiment. If I am to make my design according to my idea, I must be allowed to treat the chalk as my chalk and the wall as my wall. There are exceptions to the principle where higher laws come in, but the philosophy I am criticizing. Does not propose to allow for the exceptions, but to alter the rule. It does not say that possessiveness can sometimes be sacrificed, and the latter to be extended in the spirit, or that a man may sometimes possess spiritually and renounce materially. That the spirit of ownership sometimes extends to cover cases where men do not technically own. He simply sets possession in the flat opposition of creation. As if the two were not only totally distinct but definitely incompatible, this seems to me to be in itself incompatible with the mere practical action and experience of holding a piece of chalk. Besides, our society is not possessive, not by a very long chalk indeed. I do not understand what Mr. Wells and Mr. Russell mean by talking about it as if it were possessed by possessiveness. In truth. Ownership and originality do go together, and they are absent together as well as present together. And in this case, it would be about as true to say 
that all modern men are poets as that they are all possessors herded in huge levantine cities they have largely lost the memory of what is meant by owning a patch of earth it would seem to many of them as strange as owning a paving stone flitting from lodging to lodging in vast migrations of employment and unemployment they have largely forgotten the sensation of owning a house it would seem to them as fantastic as the bird of passage owning the trees in the park sold up again and again by mean landlords and money-lenders on their triumphant way to become peers and plutocrats the poor have again and again seen their small possessions scattered to the pawn-shops and the rubbish heaps and they have all but lost their tenacious tenderness for old clocks and crockery the truth is that it is precisely the paralyzing of the possessing instinct in the modern masses that has made them uncreative the limitation of liberty lies in being only allowed the use of things the impersonal and temporary use of them the disadvantage of having the use of anything is that you cannot put it to any other uses you can borrow a book from a circulating library if it is only for the comparatively dull and unimaginative purpose of reading it but you cannot cut the pictures out of the book to paste them on the screen or set them up in a toy theatre to amuse the children in other words you can only use the book in a receptive way exactly what you cannot do is to use it in a creative way and you cannot create precisely because you do not possess possession loosens a sort of pivot of free will in the mind which can turn the utility of the book in all possible directions besides the one direction for which the circulating library has designed it until men own we shall never know what they can make the limitation of liberty lies in being only allowed the use of things the impersonal and temporary use of them the disadvantage of having the use of anything is that you cannot put it to any other use you can borrow a book from a circulating library if it is only for the comparatively dull and unimaginative purpose of reading it but you cannot cut pictures out of the book to paste them on a screen or set them up in a toy theatre to amuse the children in other words you can only use the book in a receptive way exactly what you cannot do is to use it in a creative way and you cannot create precisely because you do not possess possession loosens a sort of pivot of free will in the mind which can turn the utility of the book in all possible directions besides the one direction for which the circulating library has designed it until men own we shall never know what they can make end of master versus maker section number 41 of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness 1922 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox. Section number 41 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. At the Sign of the World's End, The Apostle and the Wild Ducks, by G. K. Chesterton. Last week, I learned a historical lesson, in some sense, by going on a wild goose chase. Perhaps it might more correctly be described as a wild duck chase. Not that I had any intention of shooting wild ducks, though the country I visited was, I believe, specially suited to the sport, the country round about the fens of Lincoln and the broads of Norfolk. Those eastern flats generally are famous for such wild fowl, as also for the remains of the rich medieval civilization founded on the Flemish trade, and for expansive opportunities for the admiration of the sunset, or, for those of suitable habits, of the sunrise. Yet the wild duck I pursued was not entirely symbolical, though he was, among other things, a symbol. 
He was not at all like the wild duck of Ibsen, for example, for those East Anglian coasts had fortunately only suffered the influences of Scandinavian pirates and not of Scandinavian poets and philosophers. What happened in my own case was merely this— that a friend of mine told me that far in the interior of the fens, in the heart of a labyrinth of lanes and dikes, there was a little church which contained some medieval paintings in remarkable preservation. These pictures were said to represent scenes of medieval sport, dealing especially with ducks. After wanderings which might have led to the other end of nowhere, only that the endless roads seemed to be perpetually turning inward instead of outward, we came at last to the place, in a wilderness of gusty grass and stunted and sprawling trees, with one of the great square towers of flat flints that mark the Norfolk churches alone filling the empty sky and dwarfing everything at its feet. And it was here that I found the feature that seemed to me a sort of symbol or summary for our understanding of the Middle Ages. Incidentally, of course, that great tower was something of a symbol itself. It was not only a beacon or a thing to be seen, it is a symbol of blindness as well as sight. Nothing is so strange in human history as the things men do not see. Over all those flat lands, the only mountains were made by men, and they were made by medieval men. For that matter, in a thousand little villages all over England, there has been for centuries only one tall, stately, ornate, and orderly building. All the rest was obvious patchwork and poverty. Yet the Puritans could successfully teach five generations of English people, and especially of East Anglian people, that the men who built the big systematic building were living in savagery and superstition, while the men who still tolerated the little hovels had emerged into liberty and enlightenment. In this case, it is curiously true that faith can remove mountains— it can remove the mountain opposite a man's door if his prejudice has taught him that a mountain is only a myth. But this is a parenthesis, for my purpose here is not concerned with the old English churches in general, but with something that is to be found in this old Norfolk church in particular. I say it is something that can be found, though at first it seemed rather like something that could not be found. In truth, in that remarkable little fane of the flats, we might be said to have found everything but what we were looking for. There were indeed medieval paintings, and very fine ones, by no means hidden, but splendidly displayed. Fronting us as we entered the church door, in a great row across the rude screen, stood the twelve apostles, six on each side, with their rich colors somewhat darkened, but their gold in full glow, and their emblems and tools of martyrdom unmistakable. Facing inwards, opposite each other, were two figures of St. Michael and St. George, treated somewhat in a heraldic manner. I mean the manner that looks arbitrary until we realize that it is decorative. The armament of St. George seemed fantastic and top-heavy even for the tilting armor of the 14th century. The feathers of St. Michael seemed to be sprouting from strange parts of him as from the body of a monster. Only when we consider it as we do a coat of arms, as a pattern more than a picture, we suddenly realize that every line of it is in exactly the right place. High above all these there was a much more faded figure of St. Etheldreda, the great Christian foundress and patron of those parts, looking down perhaps the more impressively for seeming more like a ghost or a great shadow on the wall. This was, in the strict sense of the word, all very fine, but it was not what we had come to see. The attitude of the apostles, however darkly traced, could not be mistaken for the postures of gentlemen when duck-shooting. St. George was clearly occupied in killing a dragon and not a duck. St. Michael's wings might seem to be sticking out of him in an arbitrary and ornamental fashion, but they did not recall the wings of a duck, or even what the psalmist coveted as the wings of a dove. Besides, St. Michael is more associated with a goose. Nobody would venture to call St. Etheldreda a duck. We concluded that the rumor about pictures of duck hunting in the fens must have been a rumor without foundation. In short, the duck was only a canard. Just as we were trailing out of the church in disappointment and even despair, so far as our duck hunting expedition was concerned, my friend gave a cry, and I turned in the very porch to look back at him. 
He was bending over the figure representing St. Paul, which wore a long inner garment elaborately embroidered with gold. We had both passed it over as a pattern merely adding richness to the general design. But on looking closer, I found that the apostle of the Gentiles was all over ducks. He was, so to speak, crawling with ducks, with ducks and dogs pursuing them in one pantomimic dance all over the gilded pattern. It was here that the artist had crowded all his comic sketches of the sports of his native fens. It was a very good pattern, but it was made of quite grotesque pictures. It might have been the design for the fancy waistcoat of a fat gentleman in one of the Dickens novels. The first of all the Dickens novels, by the way, was originally written to illustrate some grotesque sketches of sport. It is not too much to say that, in the original scheme of the publishers, Mr. Pickwick merely existed for the sake of Mr. Winkle. Mr. Winkle might very well have gone duck-shooting in the fens as he went skating on the ice or riding on the famous horse that went sideways. The sporting artist employed on that occasion would doubtless have been ready to depict him surrounded by any number of ducks and dogs but he would have been mildly surprised if he had been asked to depict them as part of the decoration of the parish church, to say nothing of the vestments of the parson. But the older artist saw nothing incongruous in depicting them thus in mazy detail between the massive book and the mighty sword that stood for that terrible convert who was struck down upon the road to Damascus. Now that is the answer to the question I have already asked even in this article, and that is why this pointless anecdote— is also a parable. People were able to shut their eyes to the big church because it was only a church, however big, and they did not think of deducing anything from it about the number of houses or the nature of households. Because the framework of so much of medieval life was a religious framework, they never even looked at the picture in the frame. They passed it over exactly as anyone looking at the painted figures of the twelve apostles passed over all the lively little animals of which its ornament was made up. Thus, to take only one example, popular history seldom takes account of the large numbers of medieval people more or less loosely attached to the church, without being, in the full sense, either priests or monks. Students, servants, members of lay orders, and men who were merely clerks in the sense of pleading benefit of clergy, that is, being under the milder law of the church rather than the harsher law of the state. All this popular life, I suspect, moved normally within more or less clerical enclosures, as the details of the decoration seemed to dance within the enclosure of the main lines of the design. In the gradual revival of the study of such a period, we have had to investigate the religious life in order to discover the secular life. We have had to search the cathedrals to find the guilds, as my friend had to scrutinize the saint in order to find the hounds and the birds. There is no way to these things except through that Gothic porch, and this was realized even by the great men like Morris and Rossetti, who might well have wished, for some other reason, to come in by some other way. But none ever came in by any other way except the thieves and the robbers. There are thousands of little things like that to be found in every corner of what is left of medieval craft and culture. I have taken this small instance because it is small, and because it is the last that has occurred to me. The study of these old things has to be an intensive study, just as the cultivation of them anew would have to be an intensive cultivation. I have mentioned the accident by which the very approach to this secluded and almost secret place seemed in its nature centripetal. It seemed like a sort of spiral labyrinth that almost made one dizzy by perpetually turning inward. There is that centripetal or spiral pattern in the study of all these things. Progress during the last two or three centuries has been centrifugal and not centripetal. That is the meaning of science, of imperialism, of international finance. As things thrown on a revolving wheel fly outwards as far as possible, so souls spinning round on the great iron wheel that is the model of all modern machinery tend to fly outwards to seek for alien countries or to speculate about remote stars. But that wheel is running down, and the missiles that once flew so fast are now falling even faster. So far as any such iron imagery can follow the free curves of the flight of the soul, the curve must soon not only return, 
but reverse itself. The progress of the future should move inwards to the discovery of what we have and the understanding of what we know. It would seem a paradox to say that a man might start with studying one field and be promoted to study half of it, and then progress to study a quarter and advance yet further by studying a tenth. But anyone who does not understand that paradox at the present moment does not understand how much real progress is now possible to mankind. If we like to use a scientific metaphor, we can say that we have turned our backs for a time on the eternity of the telescope and see before us, like a vista, the eternity of the microscope. But the finest instances of this intensification will still be found in the work of men to whom the telescope and the microscope were alike unknown, and the claim can be tested in any corner by copying their example and by using our eyes. End of section 41. Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox. Section 42 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arden. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. Section 42, Frivolity versus Freedom, by G.K. Chesterton. In one of the newspapers in which the millionaires lay down the law for the millions, I noticed an article today which was all the more typical for being trivial. It seemed to sum up something rather curious, a kind of fanaticism of frivolity, which is being preached in such papers. Its ostensible object was a defense of bobbed hair, but its spirit was a curious flattery of fashion and innovation. Most of us understand the motives which make modern employers rather encourage this sort of modernity. Most of us know why the modern maiden, instead of saying, My mother bids me bind my hair, is expected to say, My master bids me bob my hair. But the argument offered in this case had particular points of interest. The writer indignantly denied that bobbed hair had gone out of fashion, and apparently that it would ever go out of fashion. She said that it would never be lost, any more than the automobile or any other new invention. She added, I need hardly say, a good deal more about things in general, always going forward and never going back. Well, it is interesting to know that the automobile can be compared with the notorious fixity of feminine fashions. It is something to know that a thing is as unchangeable as the hobble skirt, as immortal as the Medici collar, as fixed and final as the crinoline. The female costume must by this time be of a complex and overpowering character. If it has never abandoned anything that it once adopted, and if all its extravagant variations are now piled one on top of the other. But as it is a little difficult to believe that bustles and hobble skirts have proved everlasting achievements, it is still possible to suspect that bobbed hair need no more be permanent than powdered hair. The very fact that it was adopted as a new fashion will be enough to prove that it will soon be very old-fashioned. But the writer's argument, which has applications to more important things, also contains another test of truth in the matter. Whatever may be said by a somewhat deeper philosophy against automobiles and motor machinery as a whole, it certainly does possess the merit here claimed for it. The motor really is progressive, and not merely in the literal sense that it progresses along a road. It is also true that it did, in process of time, progress faster and faster along a road. Whether the road is the right road, in any sense, is of course quite a different question. The art of motoring did improve in that way. But how is it the art of bobbing hair to improve in that way? Is the hair to get shorter and shorter as the car goes swifter and swifter? Is the increasing excitement of the motorists to consist of an increasing incapacity to keep their hair on? The example is alone enough to upset the whole apple cart, or rather the whole automobile, of this particular theory of progress. If we are always advancing in one direction, the result in this case will be rather alarming. A girl will not be finally free till she has shaved her head. If being bobbed is progress, then being bald is profession. It would appear, therefore, that the controversialist in question was speaking in parables, and must in some sense 
be answered in parables. She could not really have meant that the world improvement of the future would consist of shorter and shorter hair, even in the sense that it might conceivably consist of quicker and quicker travel. But she did mean that something, a certain spirit, which for her is symbolized by bobbed hair, could be trusted to go on improving the world. And anyone reading between the lines even of her article, and still more of numbers of other articles in the same journal, and the same type of journalism, knows what that spirit is. Of course, it exists in very different degrees in different people. It is stronger in some than in others. It is conscious in some and unconscious in others. But the short hair and the short motor journey certainly connote to these people a certain frivolous philosophy, difficult to define, except in their own more frivolous diction. It might be expressed by saying that their notion of joy, if it is not in being merely bobbed, is in being pretty bobbish. It might also be expressed by saying that it is not only the automobile that is expected to be fast. Now, frivolity is as old as the world, because paganism is as old as the world. Nobody need be bothered, because every class contains a certain number of people for whom progress is a euphemism for going the pace. But there is something a little interesting, historically speaking, in the obvious effort of the monopolists to popularize paganism. Their anarchism is not merely an accident. It appears persistently in paper after paper so as almost to constitute a campaign that the journalistic campaigns during a war, with their artificial scares and scoops, that goes far beyond harmless trifles like that of this quite innocent lady, who thinks that women will rise to higher things by having her hair cut. It waged a newspaper war in defense of divorce, which was almost avowedly one of assault upon marriage. It never loses an opportunity, however trivial, of being on the frivolous side in the most frivolous quarrel. But it is equally eager to be on what it vaguely imagines to be the unorthodox side in any quarrel with orthodoxy. And it is curious to contrast this policy of looseness in ethical problems of sex with the parallel policy of savage strictness about the economic problems of labor. Plutocracy has no objection to paganism, but it has a great objection to Bolshevism. The capitalist wishes his employees to be frivolous, for fear they should be serious. In other words, the explanation is really very simple. Frivolity is a substitute for freedom. A certain slackness and loss of sexual dignity is the very real bribe now offered to those who will lose their citizenship in the servile state. They are being offered a Saturnalia of sex as a substitute for Labor Day. It is perhaps the cleverest stroke in all the strategy of the slave raiders, and like most of their strategy, it is as old as the history of slavery. Free love is the freedom of the slave. Promiscuity was the one concession by which those who were not citizens could still be communists. This truth could be attested by 20 historical illustrations. For example, it is the truth attested by both sides in the American quarrel about Negro slavery. The conflicting parties confirming each other in the very act of contradicting each other. For the northern antagonists of Negro slavery, the right way of putting it was that households were broken up and marriage brutally disregarded. For the southern apologists of Negro slavery, the answer was that the Negroes were largely promiscuous in any case, and probably preferred to be so. In other words, one disputant complained that slave families were disregarded, and the other disputant consoled him by saying that there were no slave families to disregard. Between these two arguments, it will not be difficult for a third party to infer at least that no very rigid code of fidelity in these matters was actually demanded of the black man by the white, nor will it be demanded of a white slave any more than of a black one. Indeed, in this sense, there is a great truth in the journalistic and rather sensational use of the phrase white slave. In one sense, the white slave may have a great deal of liberty. For those who interpret it merely as laxity, the white slaves of the old pagan world often attained all that a free lover would call freedom, and the master of the new servile state will say to the servile proletarian of the future exactly what the lord of the pagan slave state said to the pagan slave or the lord of the negro slave state to the negro slave. So far as sex is concerned, you can pretty well let yourself go as often as you have the chance. You have no family heritage. You have no family name.
You have no property. You have no reputation. It does not matter whether your children are legitimate or illegitimate. For there is nothing that they can legitimately inherit. It does not matter whether your family remains respectable. For nobody will be called upon to respect it. For me, you are simply something that is meant to work. And it does not matter to me how or when you manage to play. Lucky brute, run away and play. And thank your brute gods that you have no vows. And that you have no honor. That you have no name. That was the pagan attitude. And that is the common human attitude towards slaves. And that is the attitude of the modern press to the modern proletariat. Insofar as they are merely pagan. But there is this difference. That in countries where the Christian tradition has been. There is also something that is not pagan but rather Puritan. For Puritanism is a disease of Christianity. Just as capitalism is a disease of property. Therefore, the modern world suffers more from the ancient world, from fads that have the intensity of fates, at least has so suffered ever since the Reformation, that is, ever since the sort of enthusiast who was once content to found a religious order felt it necessary to found a religion. The Puritan vinegar was the second fermentation of the Christian wine. Whenever this acid fermentation has taken place, there is another element complicating the natural connection between slavery and free love. The Puritan feels a responsibility for the slave without feeling respect for the man. He cannot forget the morality of the thing even when he means to make it more moral. And as the corruption of the best is the worst, the Puritan tyranny is worse than the pagan tyranny. It cannot rise to the carelessness of paganism. It is not content with making the labors of the servant useful to the master. It wishes to make the very pleasures of the servant also useful to the master. From this arises all the capitalist philanthropy, which enforces athletics or overseas amusements. It is stating a very grim and ironic truth in saying that it encourages exercise. Here all entertainment is exercise, and only exercise, for it is the preparation for something else. Play is only exercise for work, and work is not work for the profit of the worker, but of the owner. The worker enjoys even sport for the sake of something else, for the benefit of somebody else. From this also, of course, comes every kind of discipline regarding the diet of the slaves. Tatalism today, and possibly vegetarianism tomorrow. From this, finally, comes the insane insolence of eugenics. It seeks to use the pleasure of sex, just as it uses the pleasure of sport. If there lingers some shadowy difference in the party politics, even of this last and most ludicrous of political elections, perhaps this is the difference. If there really are two parties, perhaps they are the two parties of the pagan slave owner and the Puritan slave owner. The former uses sexuality as bait for slavery. The latter is more scientific and would enslave even sex. Between these two types of slavery, it might be an interesting problem to choose. I do not know any constituency where a third candidate is standing for freedom. End of section 42. Recording by Arden. Section 43 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fernandez. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton, Section 43. That master of paradox, the Dean of St. Paul's, has been at it again with his gay flippancies, and in a recent issue of the Evening Standard, gave an excellent example of the sides of the paradox as a way of being wrong on both sides at once. It may be an exaggeration to compare the dean to a fairy, but he certainly has the faculty of the Shakespeare in fairies of following darkness like a dream, that is, of moving from point to point so carefully 
as always to remain in the dark. He is the citizen of an empire on which the sun never rises. How it is possible to box the compass without taking the sun is best illustrated in his own words. Some systems of education aim deliberately at making the pupil suggestible for life in certain directions. He is wrongly discouraged from challenging authority. We find exactly the same methods in Roman Catholic schools and in socialist schools. A violent twist is given to the children's minds, which it is hoped they will never be able to rectify. The system usually succeeds only too well. The victim of such training remains for life, incapable of thinking impartially for himself. Even when, as sometimes happens, there is a rigorous reaction against the mental servitude imposed upon him, he becomes not a reasonable citizen but a rebel, again the government, no matter what the merits of the case may be. If our rulers had known a little more psychology, they could have seen that the one hope for Ireland depended on taking primary education out of the hands of the priests. Since the dean is interested in psychology, he will be glad to know that his own psychological process when writing this paragraph is very transparent and very entertaining. It is to the scientific eye like watching performing insects in a glass case. First of all, he started out with the idea that it might be possible to have a dig at Catholicism under cover of talking about education, and he selected the old conventional and commonplace fiction that Catholicism crushes the mind with a meekness that is mere servile submission. He throws in the socialists simply because they happen to be another sort of people he dislikes. Then he suddenly remembers that the Irish are Catholics, and that the Irish, though despicable and detestable in the last degree, are not exactly despised for their meekness or detested for their submissiveness. He remembers abruptly that the Irish are hardly notable for their servile obedience and passive non-resistance. Even the socialists do not quite seem to fit in somehow. He has to reconstruct his great psychological and educational theory in a great hurry. The great psychological word reaction comes to his rescue. The Irish and the socialists experience a reaction by which their depressing education unduly exhilarates them and they are systematically silenced by being made too noisy. Everyone knows that Dean Ng is the great admirer of Chinese labor in this country, and I think he would be a little surprised if I denounced China as the nation of ancestor worshippers who had naturally become a nation of parasites. I think he might sometimes be tempted to sympathize with Islam against Christendom, and I think he would consider it odd if I said that the Muslims were such strict iconoclasts that they had all without exception become idolaters. He would not be immediately convinced if I proved that the passive character of the Hindu religion was the explanation of the feverish and ferocious activity of Hindus. It would seem a little too suggestive of that familiar criticism about paradoxes. The truth of the matter, of course, is perfectly simple. It is that the dean is entirely wrong about the first facts with which his argument begins. The Hindu religion may in a sense be passive, and Hindus may be in the same sense passive. But the Catholic religion is not in any sense servile, and anyhow, he himself is witness to the fact that the Catholics are not servile. The creed does not crush a man's critical power in any sense whatever. It does not try to do it. But anyhow, he himself admits 
that it does not do it. He himself admits that it does the exact opposite. He actually sets out to sneer at us for a subservience and has to end the sentence by snarling at our liberty. And now let me apply to the passage the simple test of an elementary knowledge of history. What has been the actual working in practice of this paradox about obedience and rebellion? Unquestionably, the dean is quite right in his formal statements. Catholics, including Irish Catholics, are taught that certain things are true by authority, and Catholics, especially Irish Catholics, do find themselves in conflict with government. Let us consider the concrete facts of what these contradictions have actually been. Irish Catholics, for instance, are taught by the authority of their priests a mystical theory of the value of something called purity. For example, that a woman's possession of herself and freedom from lawless touch is a part of her dignity. We need not here argue about this arbitrary notion. It certainly is affirmed with an authority which claims to be absolute and supernatural. Very well, the people thus instructed did find themselves under a government like that of Pitt in 1798, and this government found it convenient to restore order to the country by a military campaign which very largely consisted of outrages on women. This produced on the drugged intellects of the Catholic a curious corresponding impression. Obsessed with this doctrine of theirs, they did undoubtedly conclude that a rule by rape was in some way wrong. They found themselves against, or as the dean would prefer to say, again, the government. People of the sort oppose such government, whatever it does. Whether it tried rape or arson or massacres or the most varied forms of torture, they remained nevertheless dissatisfied and aloof. The irreconcilable Catholics remained rebels, and their rebellion did, as the dean says, depend on their arbitrary doctrine. It is quite true that if education had been taken out of the hands of the priests and the people had been taught that purity was worthless, they would not have had that reason for rebellious feelings. Or again, it is true that the smallest Catholic children are taught that the oppression of the poor is a sin crying to heaven for vengeance, and the dogma thus imposed upon them doubtless remained in their minds when thousands of them were evicted merely for voting for their own freedom and deliberately driven to starvation or exile. The dean would never have been puzzled so much by their spirit of opposition to government if their minds had not been artificially affected by the dogma about the moral peril of misgovernment. The same principle might be extended to any number of small examples. Castlereagh might have more chance of being remembered as a martyred saint if Catholics had not been taught that bribery is wrong. Pigott might be a more popular figure if they had not been taught that forgery is wrong. Clanricard might be an object of affection if their minds had not been drilled in the doctrine that avarice is one of the seven deadly sins. In other words, the dean is quite right in supposing that there is a connection between the authority in religion and the resistance in politics. But he is wrong in supposing that the connection is merely a reaction. The connection is merely a logical connection between the Irish having been dogmatically taught that certain things are wicked and the English having incessantly done them. But it is perfectly true that it is the morality taught by priests which injects into the popular mind the notion 
that a black and tan was not perfectly moral. In that sense, the dean is quite right. Indeed, he is more right than he knows. The Irish were again that sort of government because they had been educated to think that sort of government was again God Almighty. But in the face of these plain facts, which no historian has ever dared to deny, which range over the whole of recent history, from the terror of 98, a hundred years ago, to the terror of the black and tans two years ago, I would respectfully suggest that the Dean of St. Paul's is making a fool of himself in regarding Irish rebellion as a curious problem of psychology. There are many curious problems of psychology in the modern world, not excluding that of an educated and sane man who conceives it possible to take away popular education from the popular priesthood. I do not know what teachers he would substitute, but unless he substitutes those who will teach people that robbery is right, that cruelty is admirable, that any wrong can be done to the women and the weak of a conquered country, and that any lies can be told to whitewash those who have done it, he will be nearer to teaching anything that will justify the English record in Ireland. The morality substituted for the Catholic will have to be conceived on bold and novel lines. And I should like to see this distinguished Christian cleric develop it in his own entertaining fashion. End of section 43 Recording by Michelle Fernandez. Section 44 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 44. Whenever a travelling fair with swings and roundabouts comes down to Beaconsfield, I always go to see it and generally ride on one of the revolving wooden horses or throw sticks at the Aunt Sally. The latest circus of the sort provides a variation on these sports by inviting us all into booths not to throw sticks at a doll, but to make crosses on a piece of paper, possibly analogous to the game of noughts and crosses. Players are divided according to their preference for blue or red, but there are various additional flourishes about progress and public welfare. I wish I could think that the progress and public welfare would really follow. I also wish that the wooden horses would break loose from the roundabout and gallop gloriously across green fields as a cavalry charge of the revolt. I think one is about as likely as the other, especially in the circumstances of this particular district, and I should like to note them as a curiosity in case I am never allowed to write about them in any other paper. Some years ago, by an arbitrary alteration of boundaries, all the population passed automatically out of the constituency of the man they had elected into the constituency of a man they had not elected. These free and independent voters were simply handed over to him like a conquered population or like serfs tied to the land. He was the conservative member for an adjoining area because all these agricultural areas are regarded as Tory in tradition and loyal to the old English squires. And, therefore, by way of a final joke, his name appears again in this feudal position, and his name is Lionel de Rothschild. This, then, will be the highly pantomimic position on polling day in the little town where I live. All my Tory friends and neighbours, all the honest people who read the Morning Post, the most honest of the Tory journals, all the people who have learned to lament the surrender to the Jews in Palestine, to denounce the cosmopolitan treachery of Jewish finance, to curse the name of Isaac and Samuel for being Jewish and not English, will all march merrily off with ribbons and banners to vote for a Rothschild. Over against them there will be a number of my radical friends and neighbours, 
equally honest and perhaps rather more earnest, who consider themselves too large-minded, liberal, and enlightened to persecute a poor, helpless, oppressed, and impoverished Rothschild. They will vote against Rothschild. They will defend the Jew and try to turn him out, as the others will detest the Jew and try to bring him in. But they will not try to turn him out on any of the grounds that one would naturally imagine as likely to set a radical against a Rothschild. They will not oppose him because he is a plutocrat, or a millionaire, or a mere cadet of a great capitalist house, or a man raised by random wealth above his fellows. Hardly any of these things will even be mentioned as the main matter of opposition. They oppose him on the ground that he has not regularly attended the House of Commons, which is perhaps the only point on which he has my hearty sympathy. They also say that a sacred thing called free trade must be protected against a terrible thing called tariff reform, which, by the way, Rothschild's leader has solemnly promised not to introduce at all. The others will support Rothschild because he is a unionist. That he is a believer in the union with Ireland that has already been abolished, and which Rothschild's leader has also solemnly promised not to attempt to restore. In short, whether they vote for Rothschild or against Rothschild, they will all vote against themselves. They will elect a man solely to support things which he is admittedly not going to support, or even to have the chance to support. Such genuine political opinions as these people ever do express in private, they are going to do their best to frustrate in public. Some of their opinions agree with mine, and some do not agree with mine, but none of their opinions will agree with their votes. With a small working model like that immediately under my nose, I am not likely to repent my refusal to take the general election seriously, nor indeed are most of my neighbours, whether Tory or Radical, taking it very seriously. It has very largely ceased even to be taken frivolously. It has ceased to be a sport and become a routine. The only argument against this is that routine means Rothschild. The people will, so to speak, elect him in their sleep, but if I were to attempt to wake them up by going out into the street and telling them any of the real reasons for rejecting a Rothschild, it is certain that every political organisation would reject me. If I were asked why all these men making chairs or cutting down trees in the woods of Buckingham should be represented by a Jewish banker with a German name, I do not know which of the two parties would be more annoyed. The Conservatives would be shocked at my disrespect to a banker, the Progressives at my disrespect to a Jew, or possibly to a German. I might try to make the Tories ashamed of themselves by asking what they would say if a Liberal or a Labour family were posted like the Rothschild family in every foreign capital. Suppose there were actually a Signor Lansbury at Rome, and a Herr Landsberg at Berlin, brothers or cousins of our own George. Should we ever hear the last of the international treason of socialism? A man like Lansbury is accused of having friends in every country but his own, but at least he has not got relations in every country but his own, or as well as his own. That is only permitted to patriotic conservatives like the Rothschilds. Before I conclude this article, and possibly this series of articles, it is not irrelevant in this connection to answer a question which recently appeared in our columns of correspondence. A gentleman speaking for the Jews asked, in a very courteous and reasonable tone, whether our criticism was not inconsistent, since we sometimes blame the Jews for capitalism and sometimes for socialism. There is no matter I would more willingly make clear in a final summary of my whole position. It is the whole point of this paper to maintain that there is no contradiction here, but absolute consistency. Capitalism and collectivism are not contrary things. It is clearer every day that they are two forms of the same thing. Nobody will get near it by using old terms like socialist and individualist, which have become as rigidly unreal as terms like liberal and conservative. We shall get near it only by forgetting names and realising things. There is a certain mentality to which it comes natural that numbers of men should be dependent on great centralised systems 
doling out to them their food and work, if the food be ample and the work tolerable, the direction always remains at the center. Whether those directors are called owners of the capital or rulers of the community is a question which has, in practice, become something like a fine shade. The Bolshevist commissar has the handling of great wealth, doubtless in an official and impersonal way, but so does the capitalist handle even his own wealth in a very official and impersonal way. It is too big to handle in a personal way. The capitalist doubtless applies part of it to himself in the sense of living more luxuriously than his staff of subordinates, but so does the communist official live more luxuriously than his subordinates. Perhaps he is practically obliged to do so anyhow he does. Put yourself in the position of an employee paid fairly reasonably for routine work in one of the enormous anonymous modern departments of big business, and consider how very little difference it would make to hear that the remote, invisible directing power of the whole thing had been nationalized. I once heard a man defend modern monopolies of this kind against the charge of destroying competition by saying that there was still plenty of competition inside the big shop for particular posts and powers. In principle, this can only be a competition in courting and flattering a master, and is therefore morally akin to a mere mob of oriental slaves, seeing who can bow lowest or run quickest. It is not competition as it can be between two farmers or two fishermen, which is the competition of fighters and free men. But there is another point about that apology, which the apologist certainly failed to notice. In order to answer this criticism from the distributive school, he had really surrendered his whole case against the socialist school. For if this competition for posts among the employees of one business is all we require, there is no reason why a state department should not give us what we require. There is no reason why we should not all be content to compete inside one business, and that business the state. Even under state socialism, there would have to be different posts and probably different salaries, certainly different scales of expenses. In short, big business and Bolshevism are only rivals in the sense of making rival efforts to do the same thing, and they are more and more even doing it in the same way. I am not surprised that the cleverest men doing it, in both cases, are Jews. And this is not in the least because I dislike Jews, for everybody who knows me knows that I do not. It is because I know the Jews to be, unfortunately, cut off from one particular ideal, which is the only possible alternative ideal to their collectivist capitalism and their capitalist collectivism. The Jew may be a philanthropist or a usurer, he may be a social reformer or a sweater, but nobody in his senses will say that he is primarily a peasant. Nobody in his senses will pretend that the Jew has particular sympathy with the pride and point of honour of the peasant. Now our alternative policy is an appeal, not indeed merely to a peasantry, but to those ideals they are the strength of a peasantry. Those ideals of independence are native to all Western soils. They still hang about, like thunder in the mountains, in the echoes of a hundred songs about freedom. They still linger in all the legends about local patriots and the heroes of small nations. They have but one burden, that no man must accept luxury instead of liberty, and that poverty and thrift look down as from a throne on all that multitudinous humanity that bears the badge of the slave. I look out again on the beech woods of this countryside, and I know that the yeoman spirit was as native to my country as to others, and that Robin Hood could bend a bow as well as William Tell. But I know that to adopt this alternative ideal in England is truly to be a revolutionist, in a real sense in which no man is a revolutionist when he is merely a Bolshevist. That sort of Robin Hood will indeed be an outlaw and will be charged only with drawing the long bow. He is doing the one thing that is really thought eccentric. He is aiming at the centre, at the shining centre of the target. End of section 44 Recording by Christopher Gilson
Section 45 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Borden. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 46. At the Sign of the World's End. Are the Journalists Joking? By G. K. Chesterton. There was published, just before the election, in one of the illustrated daily papers, a very remarkable leading article. A considerable part of it was printed in capital letters. And well it might be. It was a convenience to have the statements set out plainly, in very large type, partly to satisfy the eyes, which, by studying picture papers, are rapidly sinking back into a savage taste for picture writing, but partly also because otherwise any reader more or less sane might really have some difficulty in believing his eyes. The big type and bold spacing were equivalent to a special and solemn assurance that some human being had really and truly conceived these thoughts and had desired to write them down. The article was all about the value and responsibility of the vote. In this, it did not differ from many others. Indeed, I imagine that some moral sentiments of the sort are kept in a solid block in most newspaper printing offices. But of the sentences that specially interested me, one described what were or should be the sensations of the ordinary poor clerk or workman when going to the polling station, and it was printed like this. There is no man in the country who has more power than I have. This, it will be agreed, is a proposition that deserves to be printed in very large letters indeed. As a description of the most ideal democracy that ever visited the dreams of men, the remark would have something rather arresting and even challenging about it. As a description of real democracy, as it can sometimes exist in peasant villages and other simple communities, it would be, to say the least of it, rather too good to be true. As a description of modern plutocracy, it is... What is it? What word in the mouth of mortal man is capable of saying what it is? Then, the little clerk or navvy, as he goes forth confronted with the knowledge that Beaverbrook or Leverhume can do nothing which he himself cannot do quite as easily, proceeds to the consideration of what his overwhelming omnipotence shall decide upon doing. In this matter, he is assisted by another sentence, which runs, There has never been a general election so serious as this one. In the past, perhaps, people may have fought and killed each other for political issues on which elections turned. Sometimes they have turned on issues for which men consented to be burned alive. But there is nothing in all this to compare with the deadly dilemma of those who have to choose between Mr. Law, who is for peace and cautious reform, and Mr. George, who is for cautious reform and peace, and Mr. Asquith, who is for peace, caution, and reform, and Mr. Kleins, who, on the other hand, is for reform and peace with the addition of caution. Now, when it comes to this sort of thing, a question arises in most of our minds, and it concerns the sense of humor among journalists. Every journalist knows that numbers of journalists have to write what they do not believe, but at least we commonly assume that they write what they want their readers to believe. But suppose, after all, that they actually wrote with the opposite object. Suppose they deliberately wrote what their readers could not believe, because it was too absurd to believe. In other words, suppose they actually tried to provoke a reaction against themselves. Suppose they worked for an insurrection by irony instead of by direct incitement. The stages of such a progress of satire would certainly be entertaining to watch, for it would be part of the art of this delicate propaganda that it proceeded by degrees. The writers would begin, let us say, by saying dull and ordinary and obvious things, 
as that Mr. George is a wizard, that he has magnets for eyes, and that this personal fascination accounts for his colossal popularity with the English trade unions and the English gentry. Then they would go a little beyond the ordinary and say that Mr. George is a man of such immense learning that he talks Greek, Sanskrit, and Coptic by preference at breakfast and lunch, and cares so little for publicity that he invariably answers letters in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Then they would pass boldly beyond such disputable domestic details and simply assert that Mr. George is seven feet high, with a head like a Greek god, and three times the strength of Sandow. This would prepare the way for the final assertion that he really is a god, that he is a hundred feet high and wears the noonday sun for a crown. None of these statements are in the old-fashioned sense true, but all are in a descending series of truth, and it would be interesting to see at what stage, if any, of the series, the public began to doubt their truth. I remember trying this trick in the days of my youth, when a friend of mine and I were wedged in a jingo mob during the Boer War. We called for cheers for one South African imperialist after another, selecting more and more Semitic individuals with more and more Teutonic names, till the irony of our intention was perceived. We began our list of empire builders with Rhodes, and went on to Rutherford Harris and to Bate. But by the time we had secured hearty British cheers for Eckstein and Albu, the crowd discovered that it had been lured into a logical trap, and a free fight ensued. But that is the method that might very well be adopted by the movement I have in mind. The fun would consist in seeing how soon the fun was discovered, that is, how soon the most credulous found out that it was they who were being made fun of. And as I have already said, one is sometimes tempted to believe that the fun has already started. I have said that it must in its nature go further and further by degrees, but again, one is tempted sometimes to say that it could hardly go further than it has. After all, could one say anything much more extraordinary than that nobody in the modern world has more power than a dustman with a vote? Could anyone say anything wilder than that the differences between the election of addresses at the last election were the most deadly divisions in all English history? I have suggested that this game should begin, but it may be that the game has been going on for a long time and is even ending because it can go no further. We have sometimes ventured to laugh at our more conventional contemporaries, but suppose that in this sense they have been laughing at us. I trust we should have sufficient magnanimity to rejoice in the discovery of this more subtle and even secret revolution. The leader writer in the time seems to be solemn. Perhaps he is really roaring with laughter all the time he writes. The editor of the Daily Telegraph is supposed to be serious, but can anybody be so serious as he is supposed to be? Perhaps he is also dancing wildly about the office delighted with the thought of what everybody thinks about the paper. Perhaps all these educated and often excellently informed gentlemen are really only drawing elaborate caricatures of themselves. Perhaps the man writing on the Manchester Guardian is only giving his admirable imitation of a man writing on the Manchester Guardian. Possibly the spectator is only a parody of the spectator. It would explain so much that is otherwise inexplicable, and after all, what cleverer parody could there possibly be? There was a time in the great coalitionist epoch when so able a paper as the Observer practically treated the Premier as if he were the Pope. But was it only kissing his toe in order to pull his leg? The thought of which pleases me very much. There would be something national about such a note of boisterous bathos, the thought of which pleases me very much and restores my confidence in my fellow countrymen. When they butter up a politician, perhaps they were only making a butter slide. Perhaps the triumphal arch was something of a booby trap. In short, is it possible that journalists, who are intelligent enough as individuals, can take the illegible word system and the politicians and parliament and the general election and all the rest of it with such gravity as anyone would suppose from reading their remarks? Are all the men of the world quite so ignorant of the world as they make out? I should like to study once more the inscrutable faces of those sphinxes, the 
the editors of The Times and The Spectator. I have sometimes dared to guess that even, the legible word, is not so solemn as it seems. I like to indulge the fancy that by this curved or crooked English road might come at least that shy thing, the English Revolution. Irish rebels fight with pistols, and Italian rebels with guns, and Russian rebels with bombs. It would be beautifully fitting if English rebels fought with booby traps and butter slides. In the first act of the farce, there might be rather too much butter, but it is reassuring to remember that there are quite enough boobies. If the game is to make fools of our more pompous publicists, there are many who will lend themselves to the manufacture, and some for whom the manufacture is hardly needed. All the factories of a manufacturing age may be regarded collectively as a factory of fools. For we are all prone to make fools of ourselves when we are subject to flattery and safe from free criticism, and the millionaires who rule the modern state are more fatuously flattered and less seriously criticized than any of the more responsible rulers of human history. Perhaps after all the flattery will become so florid and extravagant as to cure itself, as did many of the flatteries of princes and nobles in the past. In some of the cases, such as these which I have quoted, the joke has not only become too funny to be mistaken, but almost too obvious to be funny. But to have kept up the joke, if it is a joke, so long and so successfully is really the achievement of an artist, and I offer my very hearty admiration to any such journalist. I apologize to him if I have slandered him in thinking him sincere. End of section 45. Section 46 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 46. Shakespeare and the Legal Lady, by G. K. Chesterton. There was one phrase perpetually repeated and now practically stereotyped, which to my mind concentrates and sums up all the very worst qualities in the very worst journalism, all its paralysis of thought, all its monotony of chatter, all its sham culture and shoddy picturesqueness, all its perpetual readiness to cover any vulgarity of the present with any sentimentalism about the past. There is one phrase that does measure to how low an ebb the mind of my unfortunate profession has sunk. It is the habit of perpetually calling any of the new lady barristers Portia. First of all, of course, it is quite clear that the journalist does not know who Portia was. If he has ever heard of the story of the Merchant of Venice, he has managed to miss the only point of the story. Suppose a man had been so instructed in the story of As You Like It, that he remained under the impression that Rosalind really was a boy, and was the brother of Celia. We should say that the plot of the comedy had reached his mind in a rather confused form. Suppose a man had seen a whole performance of the play of Twelfth Night, without discovering the fact that the page called Cesario was really a girl called Viola. We should say that he had succeeded in seeing the play without exactly seeing the point. But there is exactly the same blind stupidity in calling a barrister Portia, or even in calling Portia a barrister. It misses, in exactly the same sense, the whole meaning of the scene. Portia is no more a barrister than Rosalind is a boy. The whole point of her position is she is no more the learned jurist whom Shylock congratulates than Viola is the adventurous page whom Olivia loves. The whole point of her position is that she is a heroic and magnanimous fraud. She has not taken up the legal profession, or any profession, she has not sought that public duty, or any public duty. Her action, from first to last, is wholly and entirely private. Her motives are not professional, but private. 
her ideal is not public but private she acts as much on personal grounds in the trial science as she does in the casket scene she acts in order to save a friend and especially a friend of the husband whom she loves anything less like the attitude of an advocate for good or evil could not be conceived she seeks individually to save an individual and in order to do so is ready to break all of the existing laws of the profession and the public tribunal to assume lawlessly powers she has not got to intrude where she would never be legally admitted to pretend to be somebody else to dress up as a man to do what is actually a crime against the law this is not what is now called the attitude of a public woman it is certainly not the attitude of a lady lawyer any more than of any other kind of lawyer but it is emphatically the attitude of a private woman that much more ancient and much more powerful thing suppose that portia had really become an advocate merely by advocating the cause of antonio against shylock the first thing that follows is that as like as not she would be briefed in the next case to advocate the cause of shylock against antonio she would in the ordinary way of business have to help shylock to punish with ruin the private extravagances of gratiano she would in the ordinary way of business have to help shylock to punish with ruin the private extravagances of gratiano she would have to assist shylock to distrain on poor lancelot gobo and sell up all his miserable sticks she might well be employed by him to ruin the happiness of lorenzo and jessica by urging some obsolete parental power or some technical flaw in the marriage service shylock evidently had a great admiration for her forensic talents and indeed that sort of lucid and detached admission of the talents of a successful opponent is a very jewish characteristic there seems no reason why he should not have employed her regularly whenever he wanted someone to recover ruthless interest to ruin needy households to drive towards theft or suicide the souls of desperate men there seems every reason to doubt whether the portia whom shakespeare describes for us is likely to have taken on the job anyhow that is the job and i am not here arguing that it is not a necessary job or that it is always an indefensible job many honorable men have made an arguable case for the advocate who has to support shylock and men much worse than shylock but that is the job and to cover up its ugly realities with a loose literary quotation that really refers to the exact opposite is one of those crawling and cowardly evasions and verbal fictions which make all this sort of servile journalism so useless for every worthy or working purpose if we wish to consider whether a lady should be a barrister we should consider sanely and clearly what a barrister is and what a lady is and then come to our own conclusion according to what we considered worthy or worthless in the traditions of the two things but the spirit of advertisement which tries to associate soap with sunlight or grape nuts with grapes calls to its rescue an old romance of venice and tries to cover up a practical problem in the robes of a romantic heroine of the stage there is a sort of confusion that really leads to corruption in one sense it would matter very little that the legal profession was formerly open to women for it is only a very exceptional sort of woman who would see herself as a vision of beauty and the character of mr sergeant buzzfuzz and most girls are more likely to be stage-struck and want to be the real portia on the stage rather than law-struck and want to be the very reverse of portia in a law court for that matter it would make relatively little difference if formal permission were given to a woman to be a hangman or a torturer very few women would have a taste for it and very few men would have a taste for the women who had a taste for it but advertisement by its use of the vulgar picturesque can hide the realities of this professional problem as it can hide the realities of tinned meat and patent medicines it can conceal the fact that the hangman exists to hang and the torturer exists to torture similarly it can conceal the fact that the buzz-fuzz barrister exists to bully it can hide from the innocent female aspirants outside even the perils and potential abuses that would be admitted by the honest male advocate inside and that is part of a very much larger problem which extends beyond this particular profession to a great many other professions 
and not least to the lowest and most lucrative of all modern professions that of professional politics i wonder how many people are still duped by the story of the extension of the franchise i wonder how many radicals have been a little mystified in remarking how many tories and reactionaries have helped in the extension of the franchise the truth is that calling in crowds of new voters will very often be to the interest not only of tories but of really tyrannical tories it will often be in the interest of the guilty to appeal to the innocent if they are innocent in the matter of other people's conduct as well as of their own the tyrant calls in those he has not wronged to defend him against those he has wronged he is not afraid of the new and ignorant masses who know too little he is afraid of the older and nearer nucleus of those who know too much and there is nothing that would please the professional politician more than to flood the constituencies with innocent negroes or remote chinamen who might possibly admire him more because they knew him less i should not wonder if the party system had been saved three or four times at the point of extinction by the introduction of new voters who had never had time to discover why it deserved to be extinguished the last of these rescues by an inrush of dupes was the enfranchisement of women what is true of the political is equally true of the professional ambition much of the mere imitation of masculine tricks and trades is indeed trivial enough it is a mere masquerade the greatest of roman satirists noted that in his day the more fast of the fashionable ladies liked to fight as gladiators in the amphitheatre in that one statement he pinned and killed like moths on a cork a host of the women prophets and women pioneers and large-minded liberators of their sex in modern england and america but besides these more showy she gladiators there are also multitudes of worthy and sincere women who take the new or rather old professions seriously the only disadvantage is that in many of those professions they can only continue to be serious by ceasing to be sincere but the simplicity with which they first set out is an enormous support to old and complex and corrupt institutions no modest person setting out to learn an elaborate science can be expected to start with the assumption that it is not worth learning the young lady will naturally begin to learn law as gravely as she begins to learn greek it is not in that mood that she will conceive independent doubts about the ultimate relations of law and justice just as the suffragettes are already complaining that the realism of industrial revolution interferes with their new hobby of voting so the lady lawyers are quite likely to complain that the realism of legal reformers interferes with their new hobby of legalism we are suffering in every department from the same cross purposes that can be seen in the case of any vulgar patent medicine in law and medicine we have the thing advertised in the public press instead of analyzed by the public authority what we want is not the journalistic portia but the theatrical portia who is always the real portia we do not want the woman who will enter the law court with the solemn sense of a lasting vocation we want a portia a woman who will enter it as lightly and leave it as gladly as she did End of section forty six recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section forty seven of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, nineteen twenty two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 47. Bethlehem and the Great Cities. By G. K. Chesterton the burden upon us is that we are not ruled by men of ordinary ignorance but of extraordinary ignorance of many of the millionaires who so rule us we may even say that they have grown rich by their extraordinary ignorance in the sense of their extraordinary indifference to anything except growing rich 
a man who devoted his whole life to collecting stamps, would have a rather narrow outlook on history and humanity, if only because it would be limited by the institution of the postage. His album could not very well contain a yellow stamp of the time of Confucius, or a green stamp with the dragon of King Arthur, but the mind of a man collecting stamps will be much broader than that of a man merely collecting coins in the sense of money. That sort of new mismatist is narrower than the philatelist because of the nature, because by the nature of the case he collects no coin except current coin. The numismatics of one age and country, the stamp collector with extended view, can at least survey the world from China to Peru, if not from Confucius to Montezuma. The philatelist's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, can glance, if not from earth to heaven, at least from Australasia to Alaska. When a man interested in money, he's interested in the money of the moment and of the market nearest to him. Hence the very rich will generally be found to be very uneducated, not only in the sense of not having been educated, but in the sense of not having educated themselves. Such a man often boasts of being self-educated, but it would be truer to say that he is self-restricted, or even self-benighted. And as it is with the plutocrats, so it is naturally enough with their servants in plutocratic politics. Their ignorance is not normal ignorance, the ignorance of things known to Macaulay's schoolboy. Macaulay, for instance, describes with derision the excitement of the old Duke of Newcastle when being told by somebody that Cape Breton was an island. I doubt whether many people knew anything about Cape Breton, or whether it is an island, but as in the case of corruption, the awful examples of the 18th century are mild compared to the mildest gossip of the 20th. And a man told me the other day that two politicians recently got an atlas to look for the Dardanelles, and proceeded to look for it in the western end of the Mediterranean. That is not being ignorant of geography. I am grossly ignorant of geography myself. That is being ignorant of daily life, of common human speech, of proverbial expressions, popular quotations, and music hall songs. It is like not having been taught to talk, though indeed we may say that politicians have only been taught to talk and not to listen. But I heard the other day an even more extraordinary example of nescience than not knowing that the Dardanelles are in the neighborhood of Turkey. I was told that a politician, when informed that the Vatican was making some inquiries about Zionism and the Palestinian problem, said with complete innocence, Oh, what has the Pope to do with Palestine? I do not know what answer was given. I do not know whether anyone explained how the Pope came to concern himself with certain curious and remote incidents that are sometimes alleged to have occurred there. Those are only two examples out of many, and I could at random give a third not unconnected with the second. I was once at the same dinner table with a newspaper proprietor who regarded himself and was regarded as the dictator of Europe, and who really was, to far too great an extent, the dictator of England. He also shared the morbid and unnatural curiosity of His Holiness at the Vatican. He also was interested in Palestine, and in the course of conversation, I learned that he had never even heard of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. I suppose he had seen crusaders in pictures, or fancy dress balls, but he had no notion of what they did, and certainly no notion that what they did was to conquer and make Palestine a part of Europe for a hundred years, filling it with abbeys like those of Glastonbury or St. Andrews, and castles like those of Conway and Carnarvon. Now that is a point that interests me a great deal, because the traces of it are very obvious to any traveler who happens to have been there. The first fact that strikes him about Jerusalem is that it is a medieval town, long before it strikes him, especially as an oriental town. It has that curious combination of coziness and defiance that belongs to the walled cities 
and painted pails and fences of the life of the Middle Ages. The latest walls were built by the successors of the Saracens, but they are not, in our sense, Saracenic. Most of the windows and gates are in their whole spirit Gothic. The Franciscan, going by with his beard and brown habit under those grey Gothic walls, seems to be entirely in the picture, and even in the conventional picture. It is rather the Arab coming in with his coloured turban, or Bernius who seems for the moment, if only by a sort of optical illusion, to be a stranger in one string from a far-off eastern land. I had a rather parallel experience when I first saw Rome. In the case of Rome, as in the case of Jerusalem, people seem to have lost their own impressions in the disproportionate emphasis of detail among guides and guidebooks. The general impression of Rome is not the Forum, or even the Colosseum. We might almost say that they are curiosities in the neighborhood. We might almost say that they are to St. Peter's what Stonehenge is to Salisbury Cathedral. The overwhelming impression is not that of pagan, but of papal Rome, but especially Rome of the Renaissance popes. I say it is the overwhelming impression. It would not be to everybody a pleasing impression. It might annoy a man, not only if he were too narrowly Puritan, but also if he were too narrowly medieval. It did annoy Ruskin, and might well have annoyed William Morris. Nor is their criticism a thing merely to be criticized. There is in that classical exuberance much that is really florid and false. But that is the impression, and it is quite certainly the stamp and imprint of the great popes of the Renaissance. Renaissance Rome is not merely heathen, any more than Jerusalem is merely Jewish, or merely Muslim, and those huge fountains where the tritons look like titans in the twilight. They have nonetheless been really baptized by those waters. The cross on the top of the primeval obelisks is not a contradiction, but a culmination. The culmination culminates on that high column, where Our Lady stands at once vanquishing and exalting the symbol of Diana with her foot upon the horns of the moon. I have mentioned these two cases for the sake of a truth which any real traveller will have found out for himself. Our recent and rather provincial tradition greatly exaggerated the proportion of such places that is pagan or barbaric, or even merely primeval. It was much more than we were taught to suppose of the traces of civilization, and even of our own civilization. But as my memory returns to Palestine by this rambling path, I remember what may really be called, in a deeper and more subtle sense, an exception. Palestine itself was filled, so to speak, with Norman castles and Catholic shrines. And in so far as Jerusalem does often suggest the Muslim, it is chiefly because the Muslim does suggest the Crusades. But there was one experience in Palestinian travel that really is something more than merely historical, something that is too human to be historical. It is certainly not pagan, but it is in a sense primeval. It is the one thing that really does seem to be connected with Christianity, and not with Christendom. I have called it primeval because there is, in this greatest of all origins, an atmosphere truly to be called original. This one vision really does primarily suggest pilgrimages and shrines and medieval spires or medieval spears. It does rather suggest ancestral dawns and mystical abysses and the end of chaos and the creation of light. I mean the experience of Bethlehem. The heart of Bethlehem is a cavern, the sunken cave, which is the traditional scene of the nativity. Nine times out of ten, these traditions are true. This is wholly rarely the truth about the countryside, for it is into the subterranean stables that the people have driven themselves, and they are by far the likeliest places of refuge for a homeless group. It is curious to consider what number and varied versions of the Bethlehem story have been turned into pictures. No man who understands Christianity can complain that they are all different from each other, and different from the truth, or rather the fact. It is the point of the story that it happened in one particular time and place that might have been any particular human place. 
in sunnyside colonnade in italy or a snow-laden cottage in spain it is yet more curious that some modern artists have put themselves on merely topographical truth and yet have made much of this truth about the dark and sacred underground it seems strange that they have emphasized the one case in which realism really trumps realism it seems strange that they have emphasized the one case in which realism really trumps reality there is something beyond expression moving the imagination and the idea of the holy fugitives being lower than the very land as if the earth had swallowed up the glory of god like gold buried in the ground perhaps the image is too deep for art even in the sense of dealing in another dimension for it might be difficult for any artist to convey simultaneously the divine secret of the cavern and cavalcade of the mysterious kings trampling the rocky and shaking the cavern roof yet the medieval painting would often represent parallel scenes on the same canvas the medieval popular theatre which the guildsmen working about the streets was sometimes a structure of three feet with one scene above another something of the sort reminds our childish dreams in peter pan and the comparison is more profane than it might be for there is a christian version of peter pan that is more real than the real one a version of peter pan in which there is less of pan and more of peter a more serious parallel having something of the indescribable image can be found in those tremendous works of francis thompson east ah east of himalay dwell the nations underground hiding from the shock of day from the sun's uprising sound but no poetry even of the greatest poets will ever express all that is hidden in that image of the light of the world born in that subterranean sun only these prosaic notes remain to suggest what one individual felt about bethlehem and i give them to the christmas number of this paper End of section 47. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 48 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. At the Sign of the World's End. On Professors and Professors. Professor Fillmore filled the central page of this paper with a review of my very small collection of verses and I hope that the display of it will be taken as a tribute to his prose and not to my poetry. He is the spirit of criticism I do not feel competent to criticize except for excess of generosity. But in the course of it he expressed his confidence that his straws would not return in the shape of brickbats from the sign of the world's end. Alas, I know well that his straws would be weightier than my brickbats. But though I am not likely to fulfill the apologue, I hope he will not mind if in some sense I reverse it. For even as I read it, I reflected that my work is indeed like straws, and his in comparison like bricks. I believe that some of my straws show how the great wind is blowing, though others might compare them to the straws that certain psychological types are said to stick in their hair. Among the Babylonians, I believe, an essay could be not only metaphorically a brickbat, but literally a brick. Mr. J. C. Squire has inspired an architecture club with the object of uniting architects and critics, clearly that they should be united in the Babylonian manner. Mr. Squire might publish a wall and one or two turrets on the subject, and the volume of the Mercury might be a temple of Hermes. But the only sort of work that really would be Babylonian, in its massiveness and endurance, having even in paper some of the dignity of stone, is critical work like that of Professor Fillmore's Introduction to Philostratus. Professor Fillmore is far too learned a man 
to despise my ignorance still more emphatically is he far too learned to despise my levity the worst is the corruption of the best i beg to announce that i know just enough latin to put this in the original if i choose and as dead learning like that of the prussian professor is of all things the most despicable so i do seriously think that living learning like that of professor fillmore learning that is full of humor and of decision is of all human things the most glorious i know it will only amuse him if i confess to feeling somewhat dazed by the detailed metrical schemes of classical antiquity in which i appear to move with unconscious and almost unearthly dexterity as in some forgotten but elaborate dance performed by a somnambulist when i learn from him how i have written poetry i feel a little like monsieur jourdain when he discovered that he had always talked prose in the coarse sense of the conscious mind and of common cerebration i confess that i do not know what a galliambic of the catalyst is but evidently whatever it is i can do it all right i did once know what elegiacs are at least i thought i did but the news that i can write them rather shakes my credulity on the point i am haunted by profane memories of a comic song of my youth which described in a torrent of polysyllables the sensations of a gentleman suffering from a number of internal maladies of the names and localities of which he was only confusedly aware it is still further confused in my own memory especially in the matter of the spelling but i think two of the lines ran i got the oam persuadic and i don't know where i am i've got the oam perosotic in my parallelogram and there was obviously no inconsistency between this diagnosis and the further confession that i've got the oam perosotic and i don't know where it is now any discussion about psychoanalysis can bring tears to my eyes by recalling that lost lyric of my boyhood but i had supposed my own lyrics to be simpler in form as they are simple enough in sentiment and it is almost with a kind of awe that i realize their subconscious complexity i've got the gall iambics and i find it rather odd i've got the gall iambics in my anapestopod it's worse than the pianic which is going pretty far i've got the gall iambics and i don't know what they are only there is one rather important difference between the gall iambic of professor fillmore and the amperozoatic of professor freud the latter i think wants to call the amperozoatic the oedipus complex or some terrible substitute of the sort but that is not the difference i have in mind the difference is that i really do know that the gall iambic exists because professor fillmore says so whereas i do not in the least know or even think that the oedipus oamperozoatic exists because professor freud says so and that difference involves the whole meaning of that profound and much misunderstood thing which is called authority to begin with there is a difference in the nature of the studies for one is a knowledge of things which do at any rate exist to be known and the other is a conjecture about things that may not exist at all i may not know what the gall iambics of catalyst were but i know who catalyst was and i know that professor fillmore knows more about him than i do but i do not know that professor freud knows the secret part of my own mind better than i do i know that there is a pre-christian civilization in a very different sense from that in which i know even that there is a subconscious mind i certainly do not believe there is an oedipus complex as i believe there was an oedipus trilogy one reason is that the latter sort of fact has stood so long in the world that thousands of other things have indirectly confirmed it and been found consistent with it hundreds of fillmores have been at work on it hundreds of men who were both scholarly and sincere have found it to be a fact or they would certainly have denounced it as a fraud but i know that psychoanalysis owes even the appearance of truth not to being old but to being new it is run after because it is young enough to be a fashion like any young fashionable lady that is because it is not old enough to be either a fact or a fraud i may see any number of fashionable young ladies running after the fashion and the same much older knowledge tells me that both will grow old 
but Professor Fillmore deals with old things that have refused to grow old. Perhaps it would be truer to say that they have already, in a definite and double sense, grown old for good. In a sense far less silly than the scientific one, he does really deal with the survival of the fittest. All that the scientists do is to prophesy at random that the O. Ampersawatic will certainly survive. Anyhow, we shall not survive to see whether the holy Oam Perzoatic really survives or not. Now, anybody who knows anything of the real history of these theories knows that all history is a rubbish heap of such theories abandoned. The instances on which popular science and popular history insist are not really examples, but exceptions. For an example that is an exception is not an example at all. Cases like the circulation of the blood and the revolution of the earth are things that themselves circulate and revolve in the controversy, like a stage army. They cannot be selected as proofs of the success and survival of hypotheses. They are selected as the only hypotheses that have succeeded and survived. Just as Galileo is mentioned with monotonous regularity, because he is really the only example of the church having persecuted an astronomer, so his theory is always mentioned because it is almost the only theory that has been universally accepted as a fixed and final part of astronomy. And even now we do not know what the successors of Einstein will do with the dogmas of Galileo. Of the greater number of scientific theories, and even the most plausible, we have seen the instability even in our own time. Darwin's survival of the fittest will not survive. The conservation of energy has not been conserved. Some hold that the electron has electrocuted the atom. And as for the vast mass of minor speculations about physiology and psychology, there must be a wilderness of waste paper for anyone who is acquainted with the controversies of the past. For anyone so instructed, therefore, it will appear impossible for any professor to spring up suddenly as an authority on the prospects of such things. It means being an authority on the day after tomorrow, and a professor of the middle of next week. The disciples who disputed about who should sit on thrones in heaven really had a great deal more to go on than the academic person claiming to occupy that aerial chair. Yet the modern world practically only uses the word authority in connection with the author of a new hypothesis. The author is an authority on his own hypothesis, on what his own hypothesis is. But there his authority really ceases. It is far less than the authority of one who studies not a new thing in the light of hypothesis, but an old thing in the light of history. And if this be true of any science, it is especially true of psychology. For the very meaning of the word confesses that it is searching an unfathomable thing. Superficially, there may be a similarity between Professor Fillmore when he tells me I write galliambic without knowing it, and Professor Freud when he tells me that I have a complex without knowing it. But though the former is something that I do not know, it is something that I could know. The latter is really something that nobody could possibly know. I could find out for certain what a gall iambic is, and count my own metrical scansion by this test. I do not know how my own words run, in a way in which I can never know where my own thoughts come from. In other words, the old learning is at least potentially popular, while the new is in its nature narrowed by an oligarchy of mystagogues. End of section 48 Section 49 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Grimer. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1922 by G. K. Chesterton. Poland and the Pedants. A little while ago, I happened to read, in a recognised and reasonably reliable English encyclopaedia, an article on Poland. I only happened to read it, for I was playing the parlour game of encyclopaedias. It is both varied and adventurous. The information I had derived had been diversified in character, and connected by a somewhat arbitrary common factor. 
Anyone conversing with me about the revival of learning will find my information about Politian rather out of proportion to my rather rudimentary knowledge of other Renaissance scholars. It will be observed that I frequently turn the conversation to the subject of Cardinal Pole, that interesting figure, to the neglect of similarly interesting figures. On polygamy and polar expeditions, those kindred topics, I am almost in the defiant mood of a specialist. On the habits of the polecat, I challenge all comers. On the habits of the politician, a creature of somewhat similar name and habits, I can find no notes made by any naturalist reported in this work of reference. And perhaps that is because no encyclopedia can be literally up to date, and the ways of various kinds of vermin have been more specially and consciously studied since the issue of work. Anyhow, this sort of accidental antiquity is the only explanation of the article on Poland. If we wish to understand how big a blunder England made in its industrial and capitalist phase, the way to discover it is not to read the popular press, but the popular works of reference. The daily papers are accustomed to daily somersaults and daily surrenders. They are always ready to turn Poincare from a sage into a swashbuckler, or Collins from a murderer into a martyr. And it is in part of their conception of progress that with every new folly they forget the last folly, not only contradict it, but deny that they ever had it. Nobody could guess from an article on Tim Healy in today's paper what the articles on Tim Healy in the same paper used always to be like. Harmsworth could use the Kitchener he reviled to hide the Kitchener he had idolatrized, and the Daily Mail that ran George down accepted no responsibility for the Daily Mail that cried him up. But an encyclopedia does, in a dreadful sense, fix folly as it flies, and immortalize the imbecility of an instant like those pitiless snapshots in the picture papers which show a politician screwing up one eye or standing on one leg. The average encyclopedia is about ten years old. Much of it, of course, is very much older. But if the average reader will read the average encyclopedia, he will come on the reading revelation of all the tosh that he himself was talking ten years ago. If he has any conscience at all, he will read it shuddering, as it were a dreadful diary. The pitiless past will return. His sin will find him out. He will remember that he also believed in Carlyle and the superiority of simple, pious, God-fearing Prussia over popish and immoral France. He also boasted that Americans were Anglo-Saxons and that Anglo-Saxons were Germans. Is it possible that he himself once said, Germany is the mother root of nations? Alas, alas, he did. The secret has long been buried and no blackmailer has dug it up from its dark grave. But there is the record or remainder of it staring in an old encyclopedia. We did say and hear, we did write and read, things as uncouth and unearthly. We did hear people saying that the Irish had no grievance, since they had all the benefits of the British constitution. We did hear that Benjamin, the son of Isaac, the son of Israel, was a sturdy English patriot, with a passion for the English primrose. We did hear these things, uttering not a single scream, and we did hear things such as are written in this article about Poland. Needless to say, it is merely the Prussian view of Poland. It might have been translated direct from a Prussian pamphlet, and in a large degree it probably was, but like most other Prussian things, it is very amusing in an unconscious manner. The very arrangement of the paragraphs is funny. It winds up one paragraph by reciting in a dull and mechanical manner exactly what the worst of the Prussian kings, in conjunction with two other despots, did to Poland, that he made a triple partition of that national territory, or in other words, hacked its live body into three pieces with a sabre. Then it begins a new paragraph with the freshness of the morning skylark. The main causes of the fall of Poland appear to have been 1. The want of patriotism and the cohesion among the nobles, each pursuing his own interests, and the country just being divided among a number of petty tyrants. 2. The want of a national middle class, the trade of the country being almost entirely in the hands of Jews and Germans. 3. The intolerance of the Jesuits, who persecuted on the one hand the dissidents, which caused them to sympathise with Prussia and on the other persecuted also the orthodox inhabitants of the eastern provinces, and the Cossacks, who thus looked to Russia. 4. In a less degree than the first three causes, the weakness of character of the kings, etc., etc., etc. This is all very interesting, and it is very much as if somebody were to write in a daily paper today a report of the recent and rather celebrated inquest. The main causes of the death of Mr. Percy Thompson appear to have been, 1. A slight debility of constitution which rendered him sensitive to any slight shock to which accident might subject him to, two, the want of something bracing in the climate of Ilford, which may have had an 
and nerviating effect on all inhabitants. 3. The intolerance of the vicar or curates who continue to marry people right and left, without reference to these climatic conditions. 4. In a less degree than the first three causes, the weakness of the character of Mr. Thompson, who, etc., etc., etc. Now, I'm not at all out of sympathy with those who feel a compassion even for the convicted murderers in such a case. I'm not sure that I would hang any murderer. I'm sure I would not hang every murderer. But if a man were to explain the causes of Mr. Thompson's death in a philosophical fashion employed above, I should be moved to say, not without heat, that the causes of Mr. Thompson's death were nothing of the kind. I should be driven to the extremity of declaring, not without impatience, that the causes of Mr. Thompson's death were Mrs. Thompson and a young man named Bywaters. If it be necessary to add a third, to make a triad like those causes that destroyed Poland, I will cheerfully add the devil who lures men and women to destroy to their own destruction. The cause of the fall of Poland does not appear to have been, but was, the definite sort of cause which we call a crime. It was the crime of three tyrants, and especially of one tyrant, who defied God and man by deliberately doing to it what was not done to any other nation of Christendom. It was not the archaic ambition of nobles, for England has again and again suffered from that, and indeed, after the aristocratic triumph of 1688, may be said to suffer from its ill. But that did not lead to England being torn in three, America taking Wales and the West Country, Germany, East Anglia and the North Country, and France taking Kent, London and the Midlands. It was not the want of a middle class, for whole peasant nations, though whole historic periods have been prosperous and united and free from such outrage without any middle class at all. The writer thought the Poles must want a middle class, just as he thought in his heart that the Poles must want eggs and bacon for breakfast, because the English are used to it. It was not the Jesuit intolerance, for it was a time when everybody was in that sense intolerant, with the possible exception of a few of the Jesuits. The nearest to the modern notion of the undenominational state can be found in the few who speculated with Suarez or experimented with James the Second. Every European nation retained a religious test in civic matters. Why was not every European nation cut to pieces? Obviously, it was not the weakness of the character of certain individual kings. There is not a historical chronicle in Christendom that is not crowded with individual kings who had weak characters. Yet nobody ever thought of remedying the psychological deficiencies of Edward the Second or Louis the Fifteenth by extinguishing the very existence of England and France. The whole of this trick of explaining the fall of Poland is a piece of stale Prussian propaganda and has that unmistakable mark of everything that ever came out of Prussia, the lack of humour and of common sense. I am very far from suggesting that there are not real and subtle divisions of spirit and atmosphere between England and Poland, which may need not only sympathy but imagination to bridge. The Poles have their faults like other people, just as the English have their faults like other people. Only one of the faults of the English is a faculty of only seeing. We are not very likely to see the assassination of a premier in England, exactly on the lines of a disastrous assassination of the president in Poland. In England, it is generally the life of the premier and not his death that is the disaster. It is something much more than a flippancy to say that, while we are all horrified at the number of men killed in Ireland, we are even more mystified by the number of men who were not killed in England. As the perilous problem of modern industrial England unfolds itself, it will be more and more manifest that we have not escaped disaster merely by escaping disasters. Our history has really been remarkably free from a certain kind of incidental shocks, which, when they happen to other nations, we find exceedingly shocking. But it is becoming more and more apparent to the most frivolous that it is possible to experience a ruin that is not a shock, a ruin that is really too ruinous to be a shock. It has been our national joke to represent other nations, like the Poles, the French, the Irish and the Italians, as lunatics given to screaming when there is nothing to scream about. God send they may not live to see us in a more hideous fashion, as idiots still smiling when there is nothing to smile about. Something like that will certainly happen if we go on pitying peasantries for being peasantries, and refusing to face the mounting peril incurred by industrial societies merely by being industrial. The anarchy of industrial millionaires, thieving and thimble-rigging on too large a scale to be jailed as they deserve, is a great deal more anarchical than any anarchy of the Polish nobles. The disappearance of the middle class, of small fee farmers and shopkeepers is a great deal more dangerous than any absence of a mercantile middle class in the old policy of Poland. The intolerance of the plutocratic press refusing to print a word of truth about its master, 
is a great deal more intolerant than any theological intolerance of any Jesuit that ever lived. And if our nation falls by the deeper forces that are dividing and dissolving us, the weakness of character will not have been in the princes, but in the people. End of section 49. Poland and the Pedants. Section 50 of G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Grimer. G.K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton. On being called Teutonic. A very cordial critic on the New Statesman recently did me the honour to call me Teutonic, which I acknowledge, if not with grace, at least with gratitude, not unmixed with self-control, for it was really intended as a compliment. Unfortunately, the compliment was to my erudition about things of which I happen to be hugely ignorant. He begins more cheerfully by saying, Of course, Mr. Chesterton must have read all the old ballads written in the English tongue. Mr. Chesterton wishes to God he had but it is quite true that he has read a good many of them, and is always glad to read more. His position, however, becomes less secure, and he may perhaps have read all the few existing epics and fragmentary poems of the Saxon Scops. Here, alas, I must begin to wave away the tribute. No Saxon Scop, no Scop of any kind, has overshadowed my private life. Anglo-Saxon alliteration frown not upon my humble birth, and only rhyme, if it be nursery rhyme, mark me for its own. I will admit any amount of indebtedness to English ballad-mongers, but not to the Saxon Scops. In the words of one of the finest old ballads written in the English tongue, to which I am so much devoted. No, Douglas, said Earl Percy then, thy proffer I do scorn. I will not yield to any Scop that ever yet was born. A prize of one halfpenny will be offered for the most plausible scholarly emendation of the above text. But anyhow, my researches in the Saxon culture have not yet gone so far as to know exactly what a scop is. But indeed, my knowledge seems to soar far beyond any smattering about such trifles as scops, whatever they are. The following is a summary of my scope, not scop, of learning and sources of information and influence. Add to that, if you like, everything else Teutonic, be it Danish, Icelandic or German, though one cannot tell which particular poems. A reviewer who turns over the pages of, say, three representative German anthologies containing selections from medieval to recent times, one of them to a student's drinking song book, will certainly find a great deal that is remindful of Mr. Chesterton, both in this and in his other verse books, particularly noticeable in their intensely racial outlook and something straightforwardly musical, resonant and rhetorical in the language, to say nothing of their wine and beer imbibing enthusiasm. It is evident from this that I know a great deal without knowing it. I am the devil of a fellow at the study of all sorts of things, as long as they are only Teutonic, to know anything Icelandic is rather beyond my own modest claims. To know everything Icelandic would seem a considerable claim for anybody. But though the critic notes the normally and generally Icelandic quality in my personality and poetry, he admits that he cannot at the moment put his finger on the particular Icelandic saga that has had the most influence on my life. I fear I cannot help him. As a matter of fact, I don't know a word of German. I do not know a word of any other Teutonic language except English. English really is a Teutonic language. Unfortunately, it's really quite as much of a Latin and French language. Indeed, my ignorance of German is so complete that I am more accustomed to being charged with incompetence to judge the German traditions than with any inclination to follow them. When I was engaged in controversies with Germans and pro-Germans during the war, it was frequently objected that I could not judge German action without understanding German speech, to which I was content to answer that there are some actions that speak much plainer than any speech. If a Zulu burns down my house, including my library, I shall not primarily lament the loss of my pocket Zulu English dictionary, which might have enabled me to discover whether he came as a friend or foe. Yet it was quite as wantonly that the Teutonic barbarians burned down the great library of Louvain, including doubtless the dictionaries of the very Teutonic tongues which I speak like a native. If a gigantic Patagonian comes to my front door and calmly cuts the throat of the maidservant for saying, Not at home, I shall not be satisfied with sending for the Patagonian interpreter who lives round the corner to explain whether the visitor's intentions are honourable. And when the Teutonic tyrants executed a poor English sea captain for no crime whatever except doing his ordinary duty and trying to save his ship, they did exactly the same thing, and I have as quite as little need for an international interpreter. 
Crime is a very cosmopolitan form of Esperanto, and death and hell talk a very universal language. I have no need to call on my vast linguistic resources in the matter. If I talked with the tongues of men and the tongues of angels, let alone Danes and Icelanders, I should not need them to judge of the barbarians when he crosses the borders, whether he vaunts himself and is puffed up, whether he behaves himself unseemly, whether he thinks evil, whether he rejoices in iniquity, or whether he hates the truth. But though of some Teutonic things I may know nothing, I know something of the sort of people who know nothing else, and from other things that I do know I can judge of something unbalanced in their culture, even at its best. I have every reason to speak kindly of the particular critic I quoted who spoke so kindly of me, or joking apart, I thank him most heartily for a highly interesting and only too indulgent criticism. But I do not think it is an unfriendly return for it if I say that his theory of my concentration on Teutonism is primarily a proof of his own concentration on it. I am sure that he has read all the few existing epics and fragmentary poems of the Saxon Scops. I am sure that he really does wallow in everything else Teutonic, be it Danish, Icelandic or German. I congratulate him quite seriously upon his scholarship, especially in a branch of study I have myself neglected. But I think that even in his own statement there is internal evidence that he has neglected other things. He follows the tradition of the Victorian critics, and always looking amid the northern nations for things which are, were at least as common in the south as the north, and in most cases that had actually been borrowed by the north from the south. Indeed, the point might be sufficiently proved by a mere list of the words which he himself uses, in tracing all my favourite traditions to the Teutonic root. He says the quality he describes is rhetorical. Where does he suppose the word rhetoric comes from? He says it expresses a wine-imbibing enthusiasm. Where does he suppose the word wine comes from? properly understood, the case would be the same with the word music, and even with the unfortunate word paradox. Does he suppose the savage Frisians of the primeval fens chatted every day about rhetoric and paradox? At any rate, does he think they did it more than the Latins and the Greeks? But the truth is just as true about the other and less obvious cases. There are drinking songs in Germany, especially in the old southern eyes and afterwards submerged Germany. But to hear many people talk, one would think that there had never been any drinking songs except in Germany. This simply means that so long as people had a contempt for the old Latin civilization, they also had a complete ignorance of it. There are songs about wine all over the world, at least wherever the divine gift of wine has gone, it has awakened songs. It awakened songs in Germany because it went to Germany. But where did it come from? It came from where rhetoric and paradox came from, from where nearly everything else comes from. I admit I am in no position to dogmatise about where Scops come from. I am equally ill-informed about where they went to. For the rest, I should be much misunderstood if anyone to, were to take too literally the critic's phrase about my public and political attitude, which he contrasts from his own standpoint with my unconscious and instinctive attitude. He says I pretend to fearfully hate all Germans. I applaud his splendid defiance of the pedants, who split hairs about split infinitives, but I cannot admit that I pretend this, or that my real pretension is only a pretense. I do not fearfully hate all Germans. I do not hate the people who gave us Grimm's fairy tales, or the people who act in the Oberammergau passion play. I do not hate Albert Dürer or a man I'd once drank beer with in Cologne, who thought it only correct and constitutional to supplement the toast of the Kaiser with the toast to each of the separate princes and rulers of Germany giving them a mug each. What I hate is not a number of people, north or east of a particular line, but a mental and moral habit of looking for the light of progress northward instead of southward, that is, in barbarism rather than in civilization. We may call that heresy Teutonic, as it is perpetually called itself Teutonic. It is truer to call it Prussian, because the whole spell of it was the success of Prussia. It was not a nation, but a notion. It was not even a human tribe a very inhuman heresy which hardened and heathenized a large number of tribes. A simple test will be sufficient to show that this fact is not affected by any of the arguments about any of the Teutonic languages and traditions, with which I am supposed to be so familiar. My genial critic credits me with knowing the Icelandic language and the Danish language and the German language, but even his generosity will not say that I know the Prussian language. There is no Prussian language, properly understood. There is no Prussian literature. There was a Prussian system, which began with a man whose fortunate language was that of Voltaire, and ended with a man whose favourite literature was that of Kipling. 
It was an international heresy, and because I call it a heresy, I call what conquered it a crusade. End of section 50. Recorded by Joseph Grimer. End of G.K. Chesterton's newspaper columns. The New Witness, 1922, by G.K. Chesterton.